Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Tristan Cabello. I'm the Associate Director for the Master of Liberal Arts at Johns Hopkins University. And I'm also the Chair of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee uh, at Advanced Academic Program. And so the role of the committee, which is comprised of students, faculty and staff, is to make sure that um, AAP and all of its program are as diverse, equitable and accessible as they can be. This year, the committee has decided to launch a speaker series that we have entitled Important Conversations. The goal of the series is to showcase all the DI work that our faculty members are doing in the classroom, but also outside the classroom in their professional careers and in their research. So this year, we'll have important conversations about race, gender, and sexuality, but also about equity and accessibility in the workplace, for example. Our first guest is Aaron Hankin. Aaron is a faculty member in the film and media program, but he's also a radio producer. And tonight, he'll talk about his new WYPR podcast, Out of the Blocks, a Baltimore neighborhood documentary series. This podcast is really a beautiful listening experience built from a mosaic of voices and soundscapes on the streets of uh, Baltimore. Uh, Aaron is going to speak for approximately 30 minutes uh, and we will have time uh, after that for uh, a few questions. And you can start posting your questions in the chat room um, on Zoom. Uh, Aaron, welcome and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tristan and uh, and Peter. It's uh, it's nice to be invited to to talk with you all. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm 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 grateful to be part of this series. I, uh, for about the past decade, I've been working on this documentary project that uh, you know it's humbled me. It's taught me some important lessons, and hopefully, this will you know add some perspective to the larger shared ongoing conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I'm going to share, I've got a whole multimedia presentation set up for you. I, you know, we don't look good here on radio, but we try to sound good and try to make things uh, engaging. So give me a second here to share my screen. By the way, I'm coming to you from my office at WYPR, which is a windowless uh, supply closet. Um, but Tristan told me I sound okay. And that's the, uh, that's the important thing when you're on the, on the radio. Let me share this and you should see uh, this logo out of the blocks on the screen. Uh, so yeah, this uh, program, this documentary series, this podcast, it's called Out of the Blocks. And uh, this is a series that started with uh, a simple, really a deceptively simple question. And that question is basically like, how do you find stories that you don't even know exist? This is a, a riddle that I've kind of dedicated myself to for a long time. And uh, at some point, I came up with a kind of a simple solution. And that is wander around and talk to strangers and like really have conversations with strangers. Um, a little backstory on how I wound my way down this road. I'm a public radio journalist uh, here in Baltimore at WYPR. And a, a couple of years ago, this, this idea started percolating, and percolating uh, in my head for this unusual format for a documentary. I thought like, what if you could go to a city block in Baltimore and you could meet and interview everyone on that block about their life? Like, what would that, what would that sound like? What would you learn? Um, and so I got to work on that idea. Uh, I made it my mission to meet and get to know and interview everybody on a city block. I picked the 3300 block of Greenmount Avenue uh, and went out and just started talking to people about life. Uh, and I have a, a co-producer who's worked on this project with me over the years. His name is Wendell Patrick. And he's a, a great electronic musician, and he put the whole finished project, finished product to music, uh, and it was it was pretty fascinating. Um, let's advance my little slide here. If it'll advance. Let's see. Advance and advance again. Okay. So you should be seeing a collage of faces. Uh, portraits of folks from the 3300 block of uh, Greenmount. I'm going to play a little 40 second clip. This this aired at the very beginning of the show, and it was kind of a collage of everyone introducing themselves. It'll give you an idea of the the variety of voices and people that live on one city block. I'm Mr. Dorsey at Dre's Boutique. Teresa Marable, we're at No Limit Communications. Zeeshan Kaz, King's Fried Chicken. Yeehaw. 
欢迎大家来到五月花园仓。Dimitri, I'm actually we're at Stereo and Jewelry Exchange right now. Michael D. Thornton, Miller's Financial. Officer Charles Faulkner, Sector Two. Kevin Strong is the, our you know name. Lashawn Hampton Michael. Address is Mama Grocery Store. My name is Lashawn Glasgow. My name is Tiffany Thomas, and we're at Share Intensity Hair Salon. Thirty-three, thirty-eight, Grandma Avenue. Thirty-three, forty-nine. Thirty-three, thirty. Thirty-three, 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 ten. I think my business value on Greenmount thirty-three. So we put this radio program on the air, um, and I remember listeners really, it really lit people up. People really responded to it. And, um, and actually, the people on the block that we met, they really responded to it as well. Um, and I guess, like, if you think about it, like, how well do you know your own neighbors on, on your own block? And what if, you know, all of a sudden you had this window into their lives? Um, and I should say, by the way, this, this idea is not rocket science. This is a simple, repeatable formula. Uh, so we thought, like, we could, we could probably do this again on another block. And, uh, and that's what we did. And we just started doing that again and again and again. And that's how this weird idea, this idea of one block, everybody's story, uh, has ended up keeping us busy for like nine years and 80 plus episodes. Um, when you listen to these episodes of this show out of the blocks, one thing you don't hear a lot of is me. You hear the people on the block in their own words, on their own terms, in their own spaces. As a producer, I, I tend to make myself relatively invisible in the final edits of these, uh, of these productions. I like it that way. Uh, but I'll, I'll go out on a limb with you guys today and uh, pull back the curtain a little bit and, uh, and just talk about the effect that this work has had on me uh, personally as a, as a human being. And I, I guess I can say that um, it's, uh, it's an interesting mixture of joy and fear that flows through you when you embark on this kind of a journalistic leap of faith. Uh, it's kind of a radical agenda, this idea of having no agenda. It's sort of the opposite of the way that traditional reporting works, where you invite people to talk about uh, some subject that you already have in mind, and you're waiting for them to say the things that will fill in the gaps to make your story. You know, when you invite people to talk about what they want to talk about instead of what you want to talk about, you, you end up with a, a much more surprising and interesting story. And, you know, when you try to explain that agenda to people, you have to be ready uh, for some side eye. It's totally understandable. I've been mistaken for a salesman or a missionary or an undercover cop uh, quite often. But the thing is, um, once you develop a rapport with someone and someone realizes that you're really just there with nothing but your fundamental curiosity and a, and a microphone, um, I've, I've learned that there's, there's no end to what people are willing and able and, and eager to share about their lives. Uh, conversations are obviously a kind of therapy for, for everyone involved. There's nothing like the power of, of someone else's personal story to put your own life in perspective. Uh, this photo, uh, which hopefully is coming through on the screen, is uh, a photo of a guy named Clayton Williams. Uh, when I met this guy, Clayton, it was on the 2100 block of Edmondson Avenue. That's in West Baltimore. Um, and uh, when I met Clayton, I, uh, I learned a lesson about survival. Clayton had burns uh, all over his face uh, from a fire in an abandoned row house where he'd been squatting. And when I met him, Clayton was, uh, he was actually living in the back of an abandoned van in the parking lot of an auto shop on that block uh, where they would let him stay uh, because he would work there uh, as the night watchman in the, uh, in the auto shop. Here's Clayton's voice. I'm 65 now. So I, I, I've been surviving for a mighty, mighty long time. I, uh, I learned a lesson about gratitude when I met this guy, Spiro Kronis. He's a, a Greek immigrant who works as a painter. And uh, you can catch him really early in the morning. He starts his mornings before the sun comes up at uh, Greek Village Bakery. That's on the 4700 block of Eastern Avenue uh, in Greektown. Uh, and when I met Spiro, uh, we got to talking and, and he broke into tears when he started talking about his wife. Uh, I meet, you know, girl, first day here, I guess, in Baltimore. And we married now from 30 years. <laughs> Can I ask what's making you feel emotional right now? I don't know, just to, all these years, you know, I stuck with the same woman. 
you're crying tears of happiness right now. <laughs> I learned a lesson about uh, resiliency when I met this woman, Tamikia Spellman. Uh, Tamikia ran a hair salon on the 4700 block of Liberty Heights Avenue. That's in Northwest Baltimore. And uh, we got to talking and she told the story of uh, being really badly physically abused by her dad when she was a kid. Um, but uh, Tamiki is a, she's a mom now and she's determined to give her, her own kids a different experience. I didn't have a childhood. It was, my childhood was, was horrible, very horrible. So I want my children to get the best out of theirs. The fact that I can sit here, talk to you and smile after everything that's happened to me, the fact that I can do that, that's only God. So the more people I've met over the years and the more stories I've heard, um, there's an, an idea that's kind of cropped up for me that's become like a sort of a North Star guiding principle in my life. And that really is the, the idea of treating everyone I meet as my teacher for the day. When you do this, when, when, you, when you treat the people you meet as your teacher for the day, you're going to open yourself up to a whole new definition of education. Um, Sometimes people will drop these profound pearls of wisdom on you when you, when you least expect it. And they, these pearls of wisdom are not just words of wisdom. They are life lessons, uh, regrets, hopes, wishes, uh, failures, triumphs. This guy, uh, his name is Yusuf Ali. I met him in Northwest Baltimore and we got to talking and, and he taught me a lesson, uh, I guess you could say about working with limited options. Uh, when I met him, he had just gotten out of jail uh, for dealing narcotics and uh, he had court fees he had to pay, but he couldn't get a job because he had a criminal record. And now you got to go back out here and sell drugs because you can't get a job fast enough. The drug trade is just not my only hustle. Man, you tell me cut your grass and for $50, I'm going to cut it. You tell me dig a hole for $100, I'm going to dig that hole. You know what I mean? I don't care what you're using the hole for. <laughs> I'm going to dig it. <laughs> you know, so it never stops. I learned uh, a lesson about principles when I met this guy. His name is Kershid Zaman Abbasi. Uh, he's from Kashmir. And uh, back in his home country, uh, he worked as an independent political journalist uh, for an independent newspaper. And he would do this work even while the Pakistani government would regularly beat him and, and kidnap his coworkers. Uh, and finally, for his own safety. He had to flee his country. He came here uh, um, and got asylum and became an American citizen. And today he runs uh, this carryout restaurant, this sub shop, uh, making sandwiches in West Baltimore. I've been here now uh, 18 years. I've been granted asylum. I'm a citizen of the United States now, and um, I feel free here. Over stuff with the meats and uh, Friend. Do you ever regret the decision that you made to write those bold journalistic pieces that caused this path to happen for you? No, sir, never. I'm the person who stick to, to my opinion always. No regret at all. Not at all. We, uh, we learn lessons you know, not just from what people say, but from just from listening to their voices, from how they say what they say. There are, you know, I'm a, obviously a big uh, evangelist for the power of radio and the power of sound, but there are life lessons that can be found just in the tones of people's voices, tones of bitterness, tones of resignation, tones of gratitude, tones of pride. And um, I mean, because if you think about it, the human voice has been our teacher for much longer than the printed word has even existed for as long as we've been human beings, really. Uh, we're hardwired to learn from the human voice in the most elemental ways. Uh, this is a photo of uh, Bumi Owojigbe. She's from Nigeria. And uh, it has always been her dream to uh, have her own pharmacy. And uh, when I had met her, uh, she had finally made that dream happen and had her own pharmacy on the uh, 2100 block of East Monument Street. Starting this pharmacy is a big, big step for me. And I'm grateful to God. Ba, 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 ba. It's a Christian song. It's saying, ba, ba, eshew, ba, ba. Just saying, thank you, Father. Thank you, my Father. Thank you, my Father. Ba, 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 ba. Eshew, ba, ba. 
Eshehu baba muwajuwe baba. I'm going to play you uh, one more clip from a, a story that a woman shared with me uh, down in South Baltimore uh, a few years ago. This is a, this is a story that's always uh, stuck with me and kind of haunted me, really. Um, because I, this story, it kind of encapsulates everything that's beautiful and everything that's tragic uh, about love all at once. Um, this is a, a woman who's... Uh, I don't know. I didn't take a photo of her, uh, and I didn't use her name in the in the episode uh, for reasons that probably will become clear. Uh, this woman, she was an older woman, um, but she had this gentleman friend, a boyfriend who had moved in. He'd been living with her, and uh, he had left her uh, not long before I met her. He left her out of the blue one day, uh, and uh, after she after he split. She found, uh, she was in her bathroom and looking for her vitamins. And she found this bottle that she didn't recognize in her medicine cabinet. And uh, it turned out to be medication for HIV. He, uh, he hadn't told her. Um, but re what really blew me away in her story was that this was her reaction when she, when she found out. I love him. I mean, if I do got it, there's nothing I can do about it. But I don't want that man to die knowing that I didn't help him. I just really don't want him to die. That's it. He'll be back. I know he'll be back. So I'm just going to let it go with that. I guess I, I just want to say that there are the stories that you don't know existed. And then there are stories that you just can't imagine existing. And uh, my, my takeaway for you here, I hope, is that when you treat every voice you encounter as your teacher in that moment, uh, you really can fundamentally uh, redefine for yourself what it means to, to be educated. Um, I love to listen uh, much more than I like talking. Um, and so we've got, you know, a good half hour here left. Um, I'm I could show you more slides and I'm happy to talk more about the philosophy and methodology of the work that I do. Um, but I, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys too, about the work you're doing too. Or any questions you have for me, I could talk with you about, um, you know, the kind of uh, path that I follow when I'm meeting and interviewing people. Um, I can talk about the editing process, which is, you know, its own interesting um, layer of subjectivity that, uh, that I put on this, you know, seemingly, uh, unfiltered, unmediated experience. Um, but, uh, let me, let me turn it over to you and, and, uh, hear from you. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Um, let me unshare my screen. Stop share. There we go. Uh, one question that I have for you, uh, Aaron, if you can hear me, can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that it's true that in uh, the documentary series, we actually do not hear your voice too much. You try to stay out of the conversation. Um, we hear you sometimes, you know, asking some questions, but I'm guessing that this is not, of course, all that you uh, ask. So when you interview these people, you actually do have to talk to them. You actually do have to frame questions and therefore, you know, frame the conversation. And I'm sure that one of your goals here is to make sure that those voices are as authentic as they can be. But yet, when we ask a question, right, we automatically frame the conversation. So how are you navigating all of this? How are you making sure that those voices are as authentic as they can be without you getting in the way and also you know um, uh, with you you know having to produce you know an actual podcast and having to produce material here great question um yes i i i've thought carefully about this uh a lot over the years um look even when you create a ostensibly unmediated experience or something that feels unmediated as, you know, um, in a documentary or any kind of media production, obviously there are multiple prisms of subjectivity that everything is being filtered through. Like you say, Tristan, when I show up, 
um, all of a sudden I'm going to be sort of my presence is going to be impacting who talks with me, who doesn't want to talk with me. And I have to sort of navigate my way through the spectrum of skepticism that's on any given block and sort of develop relationships with different people and go back regularly over and over again, day after day to, you know, and let people know who I am. I may feel like my first job is to meet people and, and talk about this project and let, give people a chance to ask me questions. Uh, I feel like that needs to happen before it's my turn to ask people questions. Yeah. But even when I get to that point of trust and rapport with someone where they're willing to have a conversation with me about their life with my microphone and recorder, like you say, the questions are, there are, because of who I am, there are questions that I'll be inclined to ask. And there are questions that I will, for whatever unconscious bias, neglect to ask. I mean, you know, I could go out and interview someone on the block outside my radio station right now. And then you, Tristan, could go and interview them. And they'd be two completely different interviews because you and I would be, you know, we have different curiosities and we'd be inspired to ask different questions. And, um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't show up with like a prescribed list of questions. I, I really give people very general prompts at the beginning of any conversation to, and then just, you know, try to abide by this practice of active listening to yeah. sort of pull from them what's, you know, what they're telling me that, that lights them up, that make that, you know, is um, important to them. And then to on, it's like a improvisational duet to ask, you know, what's, tell me more about that or you yeah. you know I, you're mentioning this say say a little bit more about that and and you said something you know very interesting that i want to uh, uh talk more about is the this issue of unconscious bias you know which of course you know as uh, the diversity equity and inclusion committee we are um exploring a lot uh, it's it's very obvious to me that those conversations those podcasts are going, going to be great sources for the historians who will write, you know, the history of Baltimore uh, in 50 years from now. You know, what was the state of Baltimore in 2020? And so those are going to be great sources for them. You know, I mean, obviously you give really a, a, a wide overview of, of what it is like to, to live in Baltimore here. Uh, yeah. And so one of the points of the historians here is going to be also to decide, you know, what is the unconscious bias of the radio producer, you know? Right. Uh, and so, uh, when I feel the passion here, uh, when you talk about uh, this project, you know, I mean, it's obvious that you are very much in love with this project, with those uh, characters, with those narratives. Um, what would you say, you know, are your your uh, uh, unconscious biases? You know, have you identified them? You know, what are the filter that you know you are bringing to the table when you um, interview all those people that you are interviewing? Right. Well. So elephant in the room, I am a white guy who is going to a lot of blocks in Baltimore that are primarily, you know, black and brown folks and immigrants and people of color and people from, you know, you have know, come to this country, uh, more, perhaps more or less recently. Um, and so, you know, look, we all sort of edit ourselves and adjust our uh, interactions, depending on, you know, who it is that we're talking with. And, you know, that's, that's obviously an uh, unavoidable factor in any of these interactions. Um, and so I, I guess, I mean, I try to, there's a couple of things I try to keep in mind. And that is that, look, what you're hearing as a listener, as open as it is to your own uh, inclinations of interpretation, uh, it's, 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 it's gone through, it's not an immediate experience. It's my portrait of my encounter with people. It's not an unmediated portrait of a person. It's a portrait of my encounter with a person. Like when you look at, you know, like someone could sit for a painting portrait and you're going to look at all the different painters in that room at the end of that one hour sitting. And every one of those is going to look different. This is, this is mine. And that, 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 that becomes even more magnified when you think about the, the process of, condensing all the raw material into the finished product because that that ep that first episode we did at Green Mount Avenue 
I probably interviewed 25 different people and I probably interviewed each of them for a half hour to an hour. And what you end up hearing is a product that's 48 minutes and 30 yeah, seconds yeah, long. Yeah, so if you yeah. think about the ratio of what I collected to yeah. what I ended up, you know, slicing and dicing into that little two or three minute audio vignette of that person. I mean, so many of subjective decisions happened in that process, right? I mean, you could take any one of those recordings and give it to a dozen, dozen different producers and they give you a dozen different edits. So it's layers upon layers of subjectivity. And, um, you know, the principle that I try to follow when I'm editing someone is I always think to myself, look, you're going to put this, it's look, it's a great honor and a great responsibility to tell someone's story to an audience beyond that person. And what I always keep in mind is like, whoever, the, whoever, whoever hears this story, I'm going to assume that this person is going to hear this as well. And am I going to be able to look them in the eye after they hear that vignette of themselves and, and, and say, this is what I think, you know, that this is what I experience as your truth and, and hope that they, you know, accept that and agree with it. Yeah, and, and that leads me also to another question I had for you. Um, it's the whole post-production process. I mean, as you said, I mean, you interview sometimes some people, you know, for 20 minutes. And then, I mean, there's only, you know, a clip that ends up in the podcast. And as I was listening to the podcast, um, it seems to me I never could then actually decide, you know, as, um, as a listener, if the soundscape, you know, that we hear behind the voices are actually the soundscape that you hear while you are interviewing the, the, the people, or is it something added, you know, to add more depth, uh, uh, more culture, more, uh, more, you know, color to, to the podcast. And so that was really beautifully done because I mean, then, you know, I could also hear like how this, I mean, I was listening to this in, with, with my, my, my headphones. Oh, good. Uh, you got to so, listen with headphones. And so, of course, and so the stereo, you know, in there is absolutely, um, it, it's gorgeous. I mean, it's beautifully done. Uh, so, I mean, I'm assuming um, that there is really a lot of post-production. And so two questions for you. Um, the selection process, you know, what are the clips, you know, that you uh, select in order to be part of the of the podcast? And also two, the whole soundscape is so amazing. I mean, you really, you really under the impression that you are doing the interview when you are listening to, to, to the podcast. So that's, that's, I had never heard something like that before. So uh, that's really, that's really something, you know, that's outstanding yeah, that, that makes this podcast, you know, standing out. So how did you, how do you guys, what is, what is the process? How do you guys produce, post-produce all of this? Yeah. Uh, smart observations and a really good question. And yes, you are correct. There is, and again, if you want to talk about subjectivity and media manipulation, um, that sort of seamless surround sound environment of, you know, if you're in a kitchen where someone is cooking up, you know, um, yeah. cheesesteaks cheese or whatever, and you hear, you know, you hear the, the spatulas chopping and then you hear fries dropping in the uh, deep fryer, those are, those are entirely produced soundscapes. Um, I literally will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll conceive of my uh, recording sessions with people uh, in- Aaron, in, can, I, can I just cut you off? Like what, what do you mean by entirely produced soundscape? Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. So I actually, when I'm working with students in, you know, audio documentary and, and podcasting, I always try and um, use the analogy of like, you know, your, your microphone is like the, the lens of your camera. Okay. Get you get far away establishing shots, get mid-range shots, and then get those close-ups, okay? All at different times. And so you have all these different elements. It's almost like when you're recording, you're collecting a palette full of different colored paints that you can yeah. then mix together, okay? Yeah. So I'll, you know, I'll get, I'll hang out in the doorway of the place and get the sound of the door opening and closing and the little bell on the door. And then I'll come over and hang out and put the microphone two inches away from the deep fryer. And then I'll, yeah. when they're ringing someone up, I'll have that microphone two inches away yeah. from the cash register yeah. so that I have all these individual elements and I can storyboard yeah. the experience of walking in there and then being in back in the kitchen when they're talking about, 
you know, yes. be, you know how they make the food, and then that's that's how we end up, you know, as a listener having so many layers like this. That makes, I mean, really, when you listen to this in the headphones, I mean, you are completely immersed in. Right. The and actual... then there's the music from Wendell, my co-producer, who creates. Mm -hmm. And man, I never take for granted how lucky I am to be in this situation, but to work with someone who makes an original custom musical score for each episode is something that makes this thing really special in its finished mm -hmm. form. Because you'll t when I'll give mixes to Wendell and then I'll give him extra environmental sounds and he'll use those environmental sounds in the music as well. So it, the, 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 the musical score ends up literally having as its elements sounds from the block. Uh, we have a few questions from, from the audience. Just one more question. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about funding? I mean, is this, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that this yeah. costs a lot of money to produce uh, uh, that podcast. I mean, is this, is this something that the radio station is funding? Is this something that um, uh, other organizations are funding? Can you talk right. a little bit about this? Sure. Yes, it is expensive. And, uh, you know, we started, we, we created the first episode just as an experiment and a labor of love. And it wasn't, there was no notion initially that it was going to be a series. It was just going to be like a one-off, like, what would it sound like if we did this? And really it was the, it was the reaction to that episode that made us realize, you know, I think people probably might want to hear more of these. And furthermore, I think people might want to fund this. The radio station was like, you know, mildly pleased to put it on the air. And, you know, it gave them a nice feather in their cap to talk about during pledge drives and stuff. But they didn't, they, look, they don't have a budget here at WYPR to, you know, fund a project like this. So, yeah, we got with our grants person who works at the radio station and got organized with getting multiple grants from multiple uh, local grant making institutions. And uh, we, we scrabbled enough to money together so I could, you know, I could pay Wendell for, to be, you know, cause it's a lot of work for him. And um, we got enough grant money together to make a full season, which I think was six episodes. And then after that, off the momentum of that, we, st we got started getting bigger grants from the National Endowment for the Arts. And okay. those grants came with the, um, the, the imperative um, that we were going to take this documentary model to other neighborhoods in other cities across the country. And that's when it really blew up. And I mean, we've done episodes in Seattle, uh, St. Louis, Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, uh, Oakland, California. We did one on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. We went to Juneau, Alaska and made one. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was kind of a snowball effect with funding uh, from bigger and bigger organizations. Um, so okay. yeah, it's kind of, if, you know, if the person who's asking the question is curious, it, it was kind of a matter of, you got to, you got to make something for the funders to like yeah, sink absolutely. their teeth and that's, into. That's, uh, that's very inspirational for our students too, you know, who, you know, yeah. always have, you know, good projects, you know, and you have to start somewhere. And then, you know, if it's, uh, if it's good, uh, I mean, there will be funding. I mean, and, and your story is very uh, uh, inspiring uh, to, to them, I'm sure. Um, you got to make a, a it's, it's much easier to, uh, or it's much more convincing to show up with a prototype than yeah. just an idea yeah. and funders yeah. are much more likely to you know it's just and that, you know i'm i'm sure you know people take design thinking classes and there's that philosophy of yeah. you know um a prototype uh get feedback reiterate prototype and and this is it has been you know the the whole series evolved as we went along too yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a few questions from the audience, sir, Aaron. Uh, could you talk uh, about the interview process and how you met with uh, the people that you are interviewing? How do you meet them? Yeah. Well, um, it is a lot like uh, showing up and going on 51st dates uh, when I go to a new block, um, because it re that really is the methodology uh, or for most of the blocks has been the methodology, which is show up and 
be ready to introduce yourself to a bunch of people who are initially, you got to expect going to be really skeptical about who you are, why you're there. Mm -hmm. And, and again, to, to, um, there's this idea. Well, I just, I mean, my, my, my methodology is to just show up and be uh, as authentic and transparent as I can be about who yeah. I am yeah. and why I'm there and what the idea of this project is. And by the way, what do you think of that? And to really kind of, um, I mean, the first episode we did, we really kind of made people on the block sort of partners in creating this, this, this document. Um, so that's the philosophy that I try and bring when I'm introducing myself in the project. And then, um, and Aaron, if I can, if I can cut you off, right? Is yeah, it just ahead. you here uh, on on the block? I mean, you have your mic and 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 your recorder, and it's just you, or is there a yeah, whole let me, team? Yeah, I'll clarify. Uh, it is just me. Sometimes right. my partner Wendell will come with me too. Okay. Um, and uh, when we're just kind of meeting people at first, um, and he's uh, he's uh, half Trinidadian, half Jamaican guy okay mm -hmm. um and so you know um some I, we find it uh you know kind of um sometimes makes folks more comfortable where when like yeah. a white dude and a black dude show up mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to just one random white guy yeah. um and then people can kind of self-select for who they want to kind of yeah. uh bond with yeah. um but usually once the project gets rolling it's just me and i, I the one thing i do which other more traditional radio journalists will like cringe at the thought of this. They say, never do this, never do this. But I do it, which is that I'll show up sometimes for weeks before I ever bring a recorder. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Because okay. I'm, you know, as skeptical as someone's gonna be, they'll be 10 times more skeptical if you yeah. walk in with a recorder on, like, yeah, yeah. hello, I've got a microphone yeah. on. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's more like, let's, let me just let you get to know who I am. And, and as the project's gone on, it's been really helpful to have this archive where I can have my iPad with me and I can go through sure, the slideshow. Wendell takes mm -hmm. portraits of everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes people would be like, oh, I recognize so-and-so from that, you know, from Pennsylvania Avenue over there. And, and people, yeah. you know, can, it helps people wrap their mind around the project that they're about to become a part of. Yeah. So, I mean, so there's, there's obviously a lot of post-production involved here. Uh, but there's so much pre-production involved too. I mean, you are yeah. going, you do you, you do your research and everything on the blog before. Uh, plenty of questions from the audience. I'm trying to get through uh, all of them. Sure. Um, uh, did you find that the community began to recognize you uh, and were people talking about your interviews? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of a crucial part of the momentum when you're on any block. It's when you show up on a new block, it's like, Things are kind of crawling along. Things are kind of crawling along. And then you meet someone who's sort of like the unofficial mayor of the block who yeah. just so happens to like yeah. love to share stories about their lives. Yeah. Um, you know, there's from any group of people that you're in, there's going to be people who the first time you meet them, they're going to tell you their life story. I love people like that. Um, they are my, they, they then be, kind of become my organic ambassadors to other people uh, on the block. So uh, say the question again. I want to make sure I'm answering it concisely. Uh, were people talking about your interviews? Did you mm -hmm. find that the community began to recognize you after yeah. a while? Yeah. So you, um, you develop this organic network of relationships with people yeah. as they open up to you. And then, um, at, you know, so maybe, you know, Joyce at the corner diner is, you know, wants you to come and do an interview with her. And then after you've recorded with her, um, you know, anyone who's coming in and out of her diner is seeing you record with her and they're like, oh, this dude's for real. He's talking to Joyce. Um, and then, by the way, you, then you and you basically you, you want to make everyone you want to kind of everyone that you meet, you kind of conscript as an ambassador to other people on the block. I always never, never finish a conversation with anyone without asking, like, who else do I want to make sure I include? on this block in this story. And they'll say, oh, you got to talk to so-and-so across the street at the tire shop. So when, then when I go across the street to the tire shop, I can say, you know, I was talking to Joyce over at the diner and she said, I really should meet you. Let me tell you about this project I'm doing. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this guy knows Joyce. Let me at yeah, least pay yeah, attention yeah, to what yeah, he's got to yeah. say. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they'll talk, you know, people will talk and then eventually you'll be walking around and, um, you know, everyone will be kind of waving at you saying hi. Um, cause people have had this really kind of 
positive kind of intimate experience with you because you've been, you know, you've just sat there like mm -hmm. listening to their lives for half an hour. Yeah. Um, and so you end up, I mean, I, I know people on other blocks better than I know people on my own block. I actually yeah. did uh, for one season finale. I did my own block, okay. uh, which is probably people always ask me, what's the scariest block in Baltimore that you ever were on? It was my own block <laughs> because I knew that, you know, I, every time I walk up and down the street now, I got to deal with, uh, yeah, I better make sure I get everyone's stories right on that <laughs> block too. Uh, one last question, uh, Aaron. Um, question from Roger. Uh, when you start an interview, uh, how does the person's apparent impression of you affect how you develop your question? I think that goes back to the question that we uh, started with in the beginning. Uh, yeah, how do you handle, you know, the reaction of the person yeah. or uh, maybe maybe what you read as that person unconscious bias towards you and how yeah. does that impact you know for example there's some there's a scene that you just played uh, in the presentation earlier you know when the greek guy uh, talks about the girl and 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 he starts crying and uh, and you know, you tell him, uh, can I ask you, you know, what makes you so emotional? You know, what prompts those questions? You know, I mean, because you could have let him talk, you know, like without asking any question, you know. So it, it's even though you know we don't hear again, we don't hear your voice uh, uh, in in the podcast too much. I think, um, I mean, I, you have to ask questions, right? You have to ask questions. Yeah. So how do you handle that? Um. Well, first of all, the first part of the question, I, li I, li I like uh, the yes is is a, is a is quite right. There are people. Some people will uh, you know like hanging out with me more than others, and some people are going to be even in, even when if and when they agree to do an interview, you know they may be they may have a very standoffish and skeptical attitude toward me, which in which case I just sort of embrace that and I'll just sort of acknowledge it. I'll so, you know like you know you. you uh, you sound like there may be more to that story, but it sounds like you probably don't want to talk to me about that. And that, that'll give them an opportunity to, be, you know, to decide how much more they want to say. Um, but really, it, it, it never ceases to amaze me. Um, the way people's floodgates will open up once they realize that you are like actively listening to someone so, and giving yeah. them your sustained yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. attention. I mean, a lot of us pay a hundred dollars an hour to a therapist to do that. Yeah, right? and, I'm and, unlicensed. I'm unlicensed, but I'm maybe the you know the closest people, thing to a therapist people, and, that someone's had in a while. Yeah, and people and and this also is very much related to all the work that we do. You know, on, on diversity uh, AP. But uh, when you're genuine, people feel that you're genuine. Right. I mean, when you yeah. when you are generally interested in listening to people's story, when you generally have empathy, uh, people will feel that. Right. So. It, yeah. And there's a couple of tech. I mean, a couple of things I do as well, where, you know, there's this idea that disclosure begets disclosure. That when you're talking, when you're hosting a conversation with someone in that interview format, you've got all that weird recording stuff on, like you got to set the tone. And if I'm able to, you know, just sort of be okay with the fact that I just look really weird and I'm out of place, but I'm comfortable in my own skin. And by the way, you know, maybe I ask you a question and you're humming and hawing about it. I might tell you, you know, my answer to that question, you know, like, oh, you know, uh, and share a little detail about my life um, just to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, and then um, what was the, uh, Keep forgetting what the second half of the question. These are such good questions. They have multiple um, questions to them. Uh, how does the person's apparent impression of you affect how you develop your question? So yeah. uh, their reaction to your own question. I mean, how do you develop your question, you know, after after yep. that? Yeah. So um, everything is on the fly and everything is my goal um, when I'm talking to someone is to get them to a point where they are telling a story about an experience that they've had in their own life. That is basically all the different questions I ask people are, are all random prompts. Like I'll ask people, uh, I've got various questions up my sleeve. Like, what do you think was the happiest moment of your life? Or what's your proudest accomplishment? Or what are you worrying about these days? Um, and whatever gets the ball rolling, um, I then, yeah. 
uh, will just start to hone in and hone in. And it almost becomes more like at one point you stop being an interviewer and you start being kind of like a story coach, right? Like they've begun telling this story and then it becomes, I feel like it be, I put on the hat of like, all right, let me pause you there. Let's zoom in on the beginning of that day. Like, tell me how you're well, like, tell me more about how that day started or what was going through yeah. your head when so-and-so did that. And that way you get, it's almost like collecting multiple camera angles for a scene that gives me in the same way that you can edit multiple sounds together to create a soundscape. You can edit multiple sort of questions and re-asking of questions to create that sort of hyper reality story that you might hear on the final podcast. Uh, Aaron, we could talk with you uh, all evening, uh, but we have to stop here. We're running out of time. Uh, and I just wanted to say that everything that you shared tonight um, is going to resonate with so many of my students' um, uh, research uh, and professional careers. I mean, I'm talking to those to my students about those precise topics, about how you do research, uh, the methodology of your research, how do you fund a project um, almost on a daily basis. So uh, this, this is going to resonate, you know, very, very much with them and also with uh, everything that we do uh, with our uh, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. Uh, how do we listen to each other? How do we make sure that we incorporate, you know, marginalized voices into uh, into the larger mix? Um, and so that was uh, amazing. And so thank you on behalf of uh, AAP and uh, on behalf of the audience tonight. Uh, that was that you're, was really great. Thank you, Tristan. You're a you're a, you're a great host and a, a great interviewer in your own right. I, I appreciate all, all the good questions. And thank, thank you, you, everyone who was uh, you know tuned in and and listened. Uh, listening yeah, and, is, is and an act so of love. I appreciate that. We will provide, uh, of course, the links to um, to uh, uh, not only you know this uh, this YouTube uh, talk, uh, but also to your uh, to your uh, podcast. Um, and I just want to tell uh, the attendees tonight that we are having uh, those important conversations once a month, and that next month we will welcome on November eleventh, uh, Dr. Redel Hearn who is from Museum Studies, and Redl is going to give a talk on soul enrichment, the art of being well. Again, this is on November 11th at 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, and you will see uh, an even bright coming out soon. Uh, thank you all for joining, and have a beautiful evening. Thank you, Aaron, again. Bye.